My first documentary on YouTube was about Operation Market Garden, where I, amongst other things, talked about Sosabowski and his Polish parachute brigade, who dropped in at Driel and effectively helped save uh, First Airborne Division from being completely annihilated earlier than they were. And I also said that in defense of Sosabowski, he shouldn't have been blamed for the defeat of our, you know, of Operation Market Garden. And the British army and the British government was wrong to blame the Poles for what was quite clearly not their, mis you know, not their mistake or their problem. So why am I telling you this? Well, I've got a couple of questions from my patrons. Uh, let's get the list going while I explain this. Uh, regarding the resistance resistance movement in Poland and also uh, specifically the Warsaw Uprising and whether the Soviets were able to reach the city and if they could have and who's to blame and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of controversy incoming. Uh, so why, what I wanted to kind of say at the beginning of this video is I am... Um, on the side, of, to, to some extent, of Poland in the sense of I would, I think Poland got a raw deal in World War II. They were left in the lurch by the British. I agree with that view, although I understand why the British government, uh, let's put it that way, didn't uh, in 1945 keep going west and try and save the Poles or pressure Stalin or whatever. I understand why, because Britain was bankrupt in 1941-42. And was reliant on the USA. The USA itself was not, there was no pressure from within the USA to kind of help the Poles. France was obviously knocked out of the war and in 1945 was in no position to help the Poles. So I think the Poles did get a bad deal, mainly because of the Soviet Union. Um, but the West, the Western betrayal, I kind of, I understand it. I'm kind of sympathetic to that, although I won't take it to the extreme and say, well, yeah, the, the the West betrayed them, and it was a conspiracy from the beginning, or anything like that. I, I won't go that far, but I would say yes. The the Poles were left in the lurch. They were caught between two ideological, em, like imperialist socialist empires: the uh, National Socialist Third Reich and the Marxist Socialist uh, Soviet Union. They came in, they took it over, they split the country up, they um, devastated. The economy of Poland, the people were, you know, a significant portion were killed. It's not good. Um, and just like I said in the Curlin series about the Baltic states, you know, these guys were, were trapped within, uh, between a rock and a hard place, basically. And it's not good. And so, yeah, I think Poland got a raw deal. And I'm sympathetic to the fact that they shouldn't have ended the war the way it did. Um, and I'm saying this because... I will be saying things in this video which may, you know, without out of context, come across as oh well, it's anti-Polish. It's like no, it's just I'm I'm flipping back and forth between several different arguments, trying to explain the history and the historiography, which means what historians think. I just wanted to kind of give that disclaimer at the beginning because I don't want anyone to be going well, he's anti-Polish or he's pro-Polish or whatever. It's like no, no, not necessarily. I just I just want to give the all-round perspective, which I'm not going to be able to do either because. This video is not infinitely long. Uh, I think you could probably do an entire series on just the Warsaw Uprising on its own. And I do, in fact, want to, much later on after Stalingrad, do a Battlestorm series where I go into detail on Bagaration and then Warsaw. But that'll be years away, I think. Uh, but yeah, I do want to do that. And until that's really done, I don't think we could really commit to this. Well, I certainly can't commit to one side or another. Um, but... In this video, what I want to do is kind of give you a brief overview of Poland in World War II and some of the arguments back and forth about the Warsaw Uprising. So, without further ado, Tiny Gay Pirate asked, uh, Hello, Tick. In some of your videos, you talked a little bit about Soviet partisans and their effectiveness, lack of in early part of the war. Could you talk a little bit about Polish resistance of Armia Kaljoja, probably, home army in occupied Poland and as part of other armies, especially if they fought on the Soviet side. Did Polish resistance have any effect on German logistics at the Eastern Front? Thank you. Let's, let's take the whole context first. So, 
Poland is invaded by Germany in September of 1939, and then a little bit later by the Soviet Union. Um, I said in a recent video that the Germans and the USSR are allies. They're not in name, but they may as well be. You know, if you jointly can, you know, invade a country, you, that's not a non-ingression pact. That's a alliance, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, yeah, so I'm sticking to that. And they also carved up the rest of Eastern Europe, as I mentioned in the Curlin series. So no, I, I'm staying. You know, the Third Reich and the Soviet Union were allies at that point. Um, not full allies, not in name, but they are in all sense and purposes. So, yeah. So, Poland is kind of caught, again, between a rock and a hard place. They resist, they do what they can, but effectively, there's not much they can do. They're getting hit on both sides. And so, even before the war began, and definitely during the war, there was movements within the Polish army uh, and the nation as a whole, and the government, to kind of form some sort of guerrilla partisan resistance movement because they knew that there's a good chance that they might get crushed between the two sides or one side might take them over or whatever so it's better to have a contingency plan and so they buried weapons and armaments and stuff or they had plans to do that during the conflict and when germany invades and it's looking pretty bad and then the soviet union invades yeah these plans are put into practice and uh, it's interesting because some of the reports and stuff uh, talk about uh, you know they, they bury the weapons and then find out they rusted later which isn't good because obviously you put it in damp ground you know and they've had to do this ad hocly because you know it's very quick destruction uh, with only within a few weeks so yeah they had to kind of just make do with the best they could and so they buried the weapons and they ended up some of them rusted and whatever else uh, some didn't bury the weapons some just went into the forests or the swamps like the Pripyat marshes and just try and live off the land. Um, others blended in with the civilians. There is actually entire regiments that disappear. And in the early days, even before the home army is really a thing, uh, there are entire regiments of Polish army units that are wandering around fighting the Soviets or fighting the Germans. And uh, they do pretty well in some situations, but they also get crushed as well. Uh, and these units carry on right up until you know, the very end of the war, essentially, uh, pretty much. We'll get to that. Um, but, yeah, a resistance movement is started earlier on, and I'm not really going to go into the details of it because it will take too long, but effectively, within a few months after Poland has been um, occupied, the Polish government has moved to Britain. So it's the government in exile in, in London, uh, the Polish army first went to France. Well, actually, it kind of went all over the place, but then went to France. Then it, it moved to Scotland and got retrained, and part of that became the Polish um, Parachute Brigade under Sosabowski. Uh, so Poland was effectively, you know, the government and the army was moved to London and Britain. Uh, there was some movements elsewhere in, uh, for example, in the French resistance, there was actually, part of it was Polish. Like, there was 5,000 Polish um, resistance fighters. Uh, so, that you know, they're in the whole of Europe, but not just Poland. But in Poland, that's where the majority were. And after a few months, because I'm just going to skip the very complicated beginning bit, the Home Army, um, I don't think it was called that at the beginning, but the Home Army, also known as the Armia Kraja, I'm not going to say that, AK, uh, was set up. And so was a government in hiding, sort of, although it was subjected to what the uh, what the British government in exile, sorry, the Polish government in exile in Britain said. Um, but it was set up. And at the beginning, the Polish government in exile was saying, right, don't, whatever you do, don't rise up in a big revolt, although we want to eventually. What you should do is stay, you know, keep it low, um, build yourselves up, hide, conduct intelligence operations, you know, maybe assassinations and, and sabotage, but only on low key. We don't want an open revolt. Um, we need to time it correctly for when the Allied armies or whoever are going to be uh, striking near Poland so that, you know, we can rise up in conjunction with that and help them out and then free Poland from National Socialist occupation and obviously from the Soviet Union as well. So the plan right from the beginning was keep low, 
don't do too much damage um, because they feared reprisals from the Germans who were already doing some of that. Um, we'll get to that. And so, yeah, the, the plan was let's just keep low, gather intelligence, you know, sort things out behind the lines and maybe do some sabotage, but make it look like an accident. So if I stick with the German side for a minute, uh, December 1940, according to the source... Uh, whoops. The Polish Underground by Williamson. Uh, according to this, in December of 1940, 43% of all German trains in Poland were in need of repair, which is a stupid amount. That's a, that's a significant amount of, you know, damaged trains. And it turns out that a lot of the, you know, not all of it, but a lot of it, was because of the Polish resistance. They were, you know, it was passive resistance at first. You know, you might have citizens who disagree, you know, oh, you might have a woman who says, I don't want to dance with a German officer, or you might have somebody who's gone AWOL from the factory or, you know, turned up late or whatever. Uh, or you might have, in, in this case, people putting sugar into petrol supplies or damaging the, the wheels of the trains or blowing up the tracks if there's a bit of it, you know, some explosives and whatever, but 43% of the German trains uh, and carriages, I believe, were actually unoperational at this time because they were in need of repair. And obviously a lot of that was because of the poles. Uh, and so, yeah, did it have an impact? As uh, as Pirate, uh, Tiny Pirate, uh, said, yes, probably. Uh, the only thing is, that's in December of 1940. I don't have... The amount of, I don't have the number for the amount of trains that were unoperational prior to Operation Barbarossa, so I don't know. Um, but I can imagine that, yes, there was something going on here. We have reports of assassinations. You know, the Poles are assassinating German soldiers and so on, although that's dangerous because if and when they did do that, reprisals did happen. Uh, there was one incident where a, sol a German soldier gets stabbed and killed, and then they shot 40 poles in response to that so this is what the government in exile was saying like don't do too much because if you do at the wrong time it can lead to a lot more deaths than it necessarily um would be wise to do but assassinations were happening sabotage was happening and a lot of this wasn't just the home army the home army was probably the biggest entity in poland which was the resistance movement but it wasn't the only one there were several resistance movements and they were all kind of spontaneously... I mean, so you can't... What the government in exile... You know, think about it in your country. What the government says and what the citizens do are two entirely different things, right? Uh, and so the government in exile is going, yeah, don't don't shoot the Germans. It's like, well, yeah, good luck with that because the civilians actually did. Uh, so regardless of the passivity of the Polish government in exile, although it's probably a wise policy... The reality is on the ground that people were rebelling, people were sabotaging. I mean, uh, the German reports at the time, the press were saying, well, there's a lot of fires going on in these Polish factories, right? Uh, the Polish resistance moved into the German-occupied territories and also did resistance there, uh, although that was hard because when Germany uh, annexed Poland, uh, it created a rump state, let's put it that way, uh, called the General Government in the South, and it kind of annexed the uh, the Prussian areas, uh, but they had to re they had to move a lot of the Poles from those areas to the South, which caused mayhem, problems, deaths. Uh, they shipped a ton of people to the Reich. Um, there was food rationing for the Poles, and because the Poles weren't Germans, their rations were a lot less than the. Um, well, probably should have got, really, for a human being. There's a lot lot of stuff I can go into here, but essentially the Poles didn't really have... They were in a really bad position, and that's just in Germany. In the Soviet Union, under the occupation, a lot of people were shipped to Siberia. We had the Katyn ma Massacre. I think I say you said the word Katyn, uh, where all the Polish officers got shot, which was later revealed by the Germans, uh, and that's a whole controversy thing as well, which we'll like, kind of touch upon that. Uh, and a lot of the farms and stuff were uh, collectivized in the Soviet side and the economy was ruined. Same in Germany because 
the Germans at first kind of were like, oh, give us some food. We want food quotas. Um, and then as the war progressed, as time went on, the food quotas demands from the Germans increased sevenfold. So by the end of the war, they were taking seven times the amount that they were from the beginning. And so lots of people were going hungry in Poland. And uh, this was all to do with what I've already mentioned about the German economy. What they essentially needed to do, according to the book, Hitler's Beneficiaries by uh, Ali, what the German economy was doing was because of the shrinking markets, which I mentioned in another video, uh, which led to autarky, what ended up happening is the German command economy was kind of disintegrating within itself. And so what they had to do was export inflation and import goods into the Reich, especially food. The reason why Hitler won his go was going east in the first place because he needed the food to feed the German people because Germany doesn't provide itself with enough food. And so... They were forcefully taking food from the Poles. They forcefully took it from the Greeks. They forcefully took it from lots of places, especially the Ukraine. Um, they did it, you know, throughout the war. But Poland also suffered as well. And so this is all to do with that policy. And uh, so the Poles were suffering starvation. Uh, you had the Jews in the ghetto. Poland's obviously a very central area for the Holocaust uh, and things like that. So basically, to paint a, a nice picture, uh, Poland had it rough. Uh, so, and that's just in the German occupied zone as well as the Soviet zone, which was, you know, the, the Soviets basically annexed uh, Eastern Poland for themselves. And uh, when the Germans advanced into the Soviet Union, um, they were, they, even when they came back, they refused to, you know, when Poland became a new state again uh, after the war. They didn't give back that territory they'd taken, right? So, yeah, Poland's got it rough, to say the least. So, when Operation Barbarossa happens in 1941, I don't have the numbers for exactly how many trains or whatever are operational, but what the books do say is that when Poland is evaded initially, the resistance was had to become passive because there's lots of German troops there. Then the German troops went to the west to fight France, and Poland, the resistance there was um, left with basically secondhand German troops. So the resistance flared up again. That's where you get the trains coming from. Then once France is defeated, the German army, the main part of it, comes back to Poland. And the Polish resistance has to kind of dive down again and keep quiet. And then the Soviet Union gets invaded. And so the German army goes east. And then... The Poles are allowed to then, well, not allowed, but they they then are able to rise up a bit more. So maybe you could argue that, yes, it definitely had a, an impact. We can see that with the 43% of German trains, but it probably didn't have an impact on necessarily Barbarossa at the beginning because the German army was there in force. And so they're not going to rise up at that point. Uh, the general sort of consensus is that over time... The Polish resistance got stronger and stronger and stronger. And thus, over time, you could say, yes, it was be becoming more problematic. But then at the same time, the Germans had reprisals against it. Uh, there is instances like um, Operation Stormwind 1 and 2, uh, which happened just before the Polish uprising in Warsaw. Uh, you had 25,000 Wehrmacht troops, which is three divisions plus a cavalry regiment and more. And this is in 1944, by the way, when the German army is on its last legs. They took 25,000 troops uh, into uh, the forests in Poland and in two operations to try and destroy the, the Soviet, uh, mainly Soviet uh, partisan units that were fighting in the east of the country. Because while the home army was operating in the west and was the biggest um you know, resistance movement in the eastern part of Poland, which was occupied initially by the Soviet Union and then obviously later on by the Germans, the, the, they were more sympathetic to the Soviets uh, and were getting arms, etc. from the Soviets. So that, that resistance movement was mainly there in the east. Um, so the Germans were attacking them with uh, anti-partisan operations as well as the in the west. The Poles mainly got supplies from Britain uh, initially, although they were getting supplied from the Americans, so you could say that as well. Um, 
they were coming through various different places, Sweden, they were coming through the south, like sneaking in. Sometimes they were parachuted in, although not at first because that was quite dangerous. And uh, supplies were trickling in, which unfortunately wasn't enough. Um, so this is why I'm saying it, over time they got stronger, but it took a while um, for that to happen. But the resistance movement was there. And as I say, it was more passive in the beginning, um, but railway lines were being blown up. There's plenty, you, you can read plenty of accounts of trains being derailed, um, as I say, sugar, put in the f fuel, uh, they stole money, they stole oil. They actually did target, at least in the middle period, um, they did actually target troop trains, they targeted oil trains, uh, and they, they hit trucks. They did, they did a lot of damage, and they were mainly going for military and oil targets, which I think is quite interesting, because it's like, oh yeah, they seem to realise... Uh, the Germans are struggling with the oil situation, so they're hitting the oil situation. You know, they're hitting the oil works. It's like, wow, that's you know, pretty interesting. Uh, so all this is going on, but the point is that over time the Polish resistance gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and the more that the Germans did the reprisals against the so the Poles, the more the Polish resistance gained favor with the population, and it became uh, pretty. It was actually described in a couple of accounts as uh, anarchical, an anarchical or anarchy uh, by the time in 1944 rolls around. Um, the uh, general government is basically panicking because lots of uh, Polish resistance is happening. And, and so Poland, old parts of Poland, were basically just outside of German control at this point uh, because of the size of the resistance movement and a lot of the assassinations. And it's interesting how just how many troops... I wish I had the numbers because it, it'd be interesting to see, but thousands upon thousands of German police units. They even brought in Ukrainian uh, police units to help out, uh, try and stop the resistance and protect the train lines. Uh, they, they, there's a one account again. I think it's from Williamson where the Germans were placing guards every twenty meters down the track of a railway line. Uh, so to each. 20 meters because the, of the amount of times that the Polish were blowing these tracks up. Uh, they destroyed bridges. They they did a lot of damage, effectively. And so, yes, it does have an impact, but it's hard to kind of quantify it because very little work has been done and saying, okay, this is, you know, a lot of the problem as well, because you asked about the Soviet side. A lot of the problem is the Soviet partisan accounts aren't really available. And if they are, they're not really widely talked about. A lot of the sources fixate on the home army. For obvious reasons, it was the biggest. And so, yes, we, we kind of know what's going on with the home army, but it's hard to say how that impacted the Eastern Front because, you know, it, it's hard to quantify, you know, oh, we stopped a, a troop train. What what impact did that have on the Eastern Front? Oh, we, we've blown up, you know, a petrol carrier. It's like, well, all right, how, how did that impact? It's hard to quantify that um, and say how much it did. But it's definitely that you can see it. You can see just by the German reaction, just how many troops they place in Poland. It seems, you know, oh yeah, this is actually having an impact. So I'll just give you a couple of quotes from Williamson, because I think he does a really good job of this. And it's actually a very good book if you guys want to read it more on this subject. So uh, in the areas annexed to the, the Reich, young adult males were also eligible for call up into the Wehrmacht on the grounds that they were now German citizens. That's interesting. By November 1941, the Poles only received 175 grams of black bread per day, 100 to 200 grams of meat a month, and only 400 grams of flour a month. There was, too, an almost complete absence of coal. Not surprisingly, the survival of Warsaw and the other big cities was dependent on the black market. In the countryside, the quotas imposed on the peasantry were increasingly onerous. For example, in uh, Jano County, uh, between 1939 and 1944, the food quota increased sevenfold in both grain and potatoes. Farmers who could not fulfill their quotas were fined or arrested, and sometimes their farms were burned down. Forced food levies, unrealistically high quotas, and a massive increase in taxation also led to a, a pauperization of the population. Food became the chief source of wealth. Right across occupied Poland, the most successful facet of, pe of popular resistance 
was the black market. Urban dwellers scoured the countryside for food, while in turn thousands of peasants and middlemen travelled to the towns to sell their products illegally. Yes, yeah, so they used the black market and it was a way of getting around the authorities, but also resistance. It's a form of passive resistance, but nonetheless, it is resistance. And so, yeah, the Poles were like, yeah, we're going to use the black market. And they needed to. They, they couldn't survive without the black market um, because of the quotas and so on and so forth, the taxation and so on, and the occupation by the German forces. They had no choice. So it was a good way of fighting against the state by, you know, uh, resorting to the free market. Detailed results were hard to come by in London, but the 6th Bureau did receive news in April 1942 that in the period 1st of July to the 30th of November 1941, about 400 tanker wagons loaded with benzene, benzene uh, had been destroyed and three oil wells in the Jaslo Krosno Basin were jammed. Further reports trickled out during 1942, showing that sabotage actions directed against railway traffic were regularly taking place throughout Poland. In March and April 1942, data sent to London claimed that 134 locomotives and 2,262 railway carriages had been damaged. And throughout 1942, it does seem that they, uh, they destroyed a lot of the lines and so on, and the sabotage attacks became more and more, even though the reprisals became more and more as well. But it's interesting because, you know, we can say, oh yeah, they destroyed 2,000 trains or whatever. It's like, well, how, how do you quantify that on the Eastern Front? Like, how, there's no way to really calculate exactly how much damage or to the logistics chain that did. But you can see that's a lot of carriages, a lot of locomotives. They've hit um, petrol carriers and so on. And we know the Third Reich is desperate for petrol, and its logistics on the Eastern Front is terrible. And so, yeah, it has an impact, but to what extent, that's hard to you know quantify. But it is, that period in 1941 up to November, this is a very crucial period for Operation Barbarossa. And as I said in the oil video, you know, Germany seems to run out of oil in the October time. So you can imagine that, you know, if they had just had that little bit more, maybe it would have done a bit you know better. But again, it's very hard to quantify something like that and say how that would have impacted because it's trying to prove a negative in a sense. But it certainly did have an impact and the Poles definitely had, you know, they did something at least. So there's also the Jewish resistance in Poland, which is actually quite interesting. I, I wasn't aware of this, so this is actually quite interesting. But in, in the Warsaw Ghetto, there was actually... I'm not sure on the numbers exactly. There was over a thousand combatants armed uh, Jewish fighters in the Polish Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, and in the January of 1943, the Germans went in to try and clear out the rest of the ghetto and had to retreat because the Jews fought back. Then uh, the Germans later returned in um, the April of 1943 with armoured cars, they had the SS, they had armoured cars, they had troops, and still had trouble fighting back and actually had to retreat and then go back in again. And it actually took them several weeks to properly clear out the ghetto because of, of these Jewish resistance fighters. And uh, they had to actually, at one point at least, call in the Luftwaffe to bomb the city, uh, the ghetto, <laughs> which is quite surprising. And... The only way they really cleared it out was by burning most of it to the ground. So, yeah, I think that's kind of interesting to point out as well. Um, but the Home Army, while this was going on, while they did supply weapons to the Jews, they, they kind of like, well, we can't re we can't just rise up in a you know in support because we'll get crushed. And it seems that the yeah the Jews seem to understand this. Uh, and the government, Polish government in exile was like, yeah, we, we can't really, we can supply you weapons, we can't really do much more than that, because if we do rise up, we'll suffer the same fate, we'll get annihilated. So, you know, there's a, there's a thing going on there, but again, it's in, it's just a whole interesting period. But So while I mentioned the, the Home Army in the West, in the East, you had the PPR, the Polish Workers' Party, and uh, this, it's interesting because we're going to get to the Warsaw Uprising in a minute with the, the second question, but... It, some of the Poles in 
this period wanted to return back to the Soviet Union. The PPR was the communist uh, you know, party, basically, in Poland, and they refused to recognize the 1921 borders of Poland. They actually preferred Poland to be annexed by the Soviet Union. And so even this, I mean, this is before we get to the Warsaw Uprising, there is a split within Poland about whose side are they on, and so generally, I'm just going to say generally, the western part of Poland was more orientated towards the west, and uh, liberty, I guess you could say, and Britain, where the Polish exile government is. But in the eastern part, there was more support for the Soviet Union. So Poland is basically split in two at this point, much like the Baltic states were as well. And there was rivalries between the two sides. The uh, PPR actually quite often betrayed members of the Home Army to the Gestapo, who then went in, arrested them and killed them and whatever else. So, yeah, there was, there was definitely no cooperation going on here. So I, I wanted to make this clear because it's not like, oh, Polish resistance and then all of it's unified. It is not. It's not unified. The Home Army might have been the, the biggest element and that might have been linked to the legitimate government in uh, Britain. But it's it's not... You, Poland is not... The resistance movement is not unified at all and there's people... We, we you know with different views and whatever else and so i just wanted to make that clear because then what i say next also makes sense i've talked about this a little bit before uh in my video on the soviet uh german negotiations going on in 1943 ish uh and i said in that video that Stalin, at the same time that these negotiations were going on, decided, right, we're not going to talk to... We're going to basically stop relations with the Polish government in exile in London. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about that as well. So there's potential of negotiations going on in 1943. Stalingrad has happened, so the Soviets are slowly pushing the Germans back. Uh, and... There's a potential for a peace negotiation. I won't go into it fully in this video. But essentially, in the middle of 1943, Stalin and the Soviets basically don't want anything to do with the Polish government uh, in exile and actually go ahead and start setting up their own Polish government. So they actually create the Union of Polish Patriots, the ZPP, uh, and a new Polish army uh, under General Berling, and uh, they challenged the legitimacy of the Polish government in London. And this is in 1943. And from this moment onwards, basically the Polish government in exile and the new Stalinist government of Poland, we'll call it that, the Union of Polish Patriots, and the, Star the Red Army, the, pa the Polish Red Army, uh, they're, they're not communicating with each other. And this is going to be very important when we get to the Warsaw Uprising because, wait a second, you want support from the Soviet Union, you're not even talking to them. Or if you are, it's hostile talking, right? So there's no cooperation going on. And basically what Stalin is doing is looking for the post-war world and thinking, well, if we are going to have an independent Poland, the last thing we want is the British version, well, the the, the illegitimate Polish government in exile, which is more about freedom and, you know, whatever else. We don't want that taken over. We want a Marxist socialist regime in Poland. And so we'll set one up in the Soviet Union to take over after the war. And that's exactly what they do. So even from 1943, it's pretty obvious what the Soviets, well, not obvious, but it's, it's clear that the Soviets are like, no, we don't want that. We want our own government. And the, uh, the PPR are in support of it. Because again, Poland is split into several parts. And while the Home Army might be the most, it's, it's certainly not the only one. And so there's a significant amount of uh, pro-Soviet resistance going on here and pro-Soviet favour. And so that's clear from 1943 onwards. And as the war progressed, it became increasingly obvious that the British and the Americans weren't going to occupy Poland, right? Because at the beginning, when the Germans and the Soviets are allied, 
the um, it's just gonna, it's just going to annoy people in the comment section. The reality is that you know only the British were fighting on, and then eventually the Americans came in. So it was more likely that if Britain was going to win or France was going to win, you know, prior to its collapse, then Britain and or France or America or whatever would come to Poland, right? And it also looked like when Operation Barbarossa in 1942, etc., that uh, Operation Barbarossa in 1941 and then Blau in 1942, it looked like the Soviet Union was on the brink of collapse or was losing. And so it's like, yeah, maybe the British will come in and maybe the Americans will come in from the West. Well, as the war progresses, certainly by 1943, it was becoming clearer that actually it's more likely that the Soviets are going to take, you know, going to occupy Poland. And this was also confirmed when the Western powers decided that they were going to land in France and not the Balkans. Not the Balkans. Why am I emphasizing this? A lot of people criticized Churchill for saying, yes, you should, we should have gone through the Balkans, you know, Italy, the southern approach, the periphery. I've mentioned that, touched upon this in the Norway video. Um, and it's like, yeah, but think about it. If he'd have gone into the Balkans, they could have ro gone up and freed Eastern Europe, not just Western Europe. So it, it kind of makes sense. The only reason why they probably didn't is because it would have impacted the Soviet sphere of influence. They didn't want to do that. Um, and the Americans were very much about, no, 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 we're going to go through France. So because that's the shortest way to Berlin, apparently. And so, you know, Churchill was actually fighting to get through the Balkans. I mean, he eventually get to Greece. Uh, but, you know, that was that was part of it. And so that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, because a lot of people say Churchill was an idiot for trying to go through Balkans. It's like, yeah, but he was thinking of Poland. Or he was thinking of preventing the Soviets from taking over the whole of Europe, or Eastern Europe. And so he was looking ahead for that. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a particular Churchill supporter. I, don't th I, I think he's an idiot overall. But politically, and in this situation, I think he was kind of right. Um, I'd love to hear your opinions on that. So as the Soviet... Red Army's moving in. They started cooperating at first with the forces of the PPR, the Polish Workers' Party, or whatever it's called, and then with the Home Army as well. But some of the accounts, um, while the first units that arrived did cooperate quite nicely, and you know, oh, they helped each other, and it was all nicey nicey, uh, it didn't last. So I'll give some quotes from Williamson because he does a good job of it. Once the NKVD moved in, all cooperation ceased. The Soviets also ordered that the Home Army should disband and be incorporated into the Red Army. So remnants of the 27th Infantry Division sheltering in the Pripyat marshes were disarmed by the Soviets and transferred to Kiev, while the officers disappeared into the depths of Russia. And on the 17th of July 1944, 30 Polish officers were asked to attend a conference with General Cherenkonovsky uh, of the 3rd Belarusian Front. None returned. They too were arrested and taken to the USSR. And to go on with another quote, some 3,000 Home Army troops of the 5th Infantry Division played a crucial role in the capture of Lvov, is that how you say it? Between 23rd and 27th of July, when the city fell, Marshal Konyev thanked the Poles for their brotherly cooperation. Yet, this did not stop the Home Army troops from being forcefully disbanded and made to join either Berling's troops or the Red Army. The Home Army officers, despite their apparent willingness to join the former, were arrested and deported to the USSR, whence they never returned. And the British government actually sent uh, a, a list of achievements of the Home Army to Stalin to say, hey, you know, these guys are good, they're valuable, you can trust them. And Stalin was basically like, nah. <laughs> um, because he had no interest in helping the Poles in the Home Army, and the illegitimate, what he saw as an illegitimate uh, government in exile in, in Britain. So, yeah, uh, the, the point I'm making here is to kind of say, well, there's clues, you know, a big neon line, you know, signs saying, hey, that Stalin's not going to allow the government, the legitimate government in exile in Britain to 
coming to Poland after the war. He's not going to allow that. And he doesn't want a home army, an, an army that's not the Red Army. He doesn't want a non-Marxist government in Poland. He doesn't want a non-Marxist army in cooperation, etc. So he's going to destroy it. Uh, and this is before the Warsaw Uprising. And so it should have been a big clue to everybody. Hey, this is not good. And Stalin's not going to cooperate. Um because this then impacts what, you know, when you think about the Polish uprising of Warsaw, it's like, well, we needed help from the Soviets, they didn't come. It's like, yeah, they're not going to, are they? Because, and it, and it's pretty clear, uh, or at least is from our perspective, maybe it's biased from hindsight, you could probably argue that, I probably agree, but at least from our point of view, it's like, no, Stalin had no intention to help these people out, and that should have been factored in before the, the Warsaw uprising. So now I'm going to read Steve's... Um, uh, question. Hi Tick, just love this channel, like another subscriber. I really hope you will do a series on Bagration and to fill it in out to completeness uh, and those operations at the flat, at the end of it. Uh, and Mod Modal's amazing counterattack on the Vistula. Uh, followed by, if you could, an analysis of the Warsaw Uprising. Incidentally, do you think Stalin deliberately held back from helping the Home Army in Warsaw or had Modal's trashing of a tank army and logistics made a Soviet thrust to help the Poles impossible anyway. So I, I my plan at the minute is all over the place when it comes to Battlestorm. So, but I'm going to do Stalingrad next. That's coming. After that, I'll probably go back to the North African campaign and then back to the Eastern Front. I don't know. But I want to do things in order. I don't want to just skip ahead and jump to something like the Polish Warsaw Uprising. I want to see the whole of Bagration, but I don't want to just skip to that. I want to see, you know, operations that came before that so i kind of want to start at the beginning of the war and work my way through to the end so people like do something on the battle of berlin it's like no i'd rather do the stuff at the beginning although i do want to get to berlin uh just like everybody else does so i just wanted to make that clear like yes i will cover it when i get to it but we're a long way off at the minute stalingrad's got to come first but do i think stalin deliberately held back from helping the home army well let's let's have a brief look at operation bagration so this is a map. Um, let me just quickly run over. This is from Wikipedia. I know, don't use Wikipedia. It's not a source. I say that all the time. But And this map isn't actually accurate, but we'll go with it because I can't be able to join a map at this minute. So this is basically the advance of the Soviet armies from 1943 to 1944. Operation Bagration is the purple bit in the middle. So you have an encirclement all over the place, and they basically strike uh, in... What I could probably say three kind of general directions. They go into the Baltics, they go towards Warsaw, and they go towards uh, the south. Now, I've covered the northern part in the Curlin series, and it, it's not shown on this map, but they actually got to the, the coast of the Gulf of Riga. Now, I, go and watch my video on Operation Doppelkopf to see this more in depth, and I would recommend that because I think I did pretty well in that video. But essentially, they barely... Right, they barely, I think it was the 31st of July, they barely reached the Gulf of Riga. And they basically just petered out, right? And there was nothing in the Curland province at this time, right? There was a few ad hoc units here or there, maybe the odd division, that was it. And so it had the Soviets had more forces, they could have just taken the whole of Curland. But they ran out of steam at the, the Gulf of Riga. They couldn't go any further. And this is important because this is roughly the same time that the Soviet armies near Warsaw come to an, a halt, like the 47th Army, I believe it is, outside Warsaw. And so, you know, it's like, well, if they're at the end of their steam in the Gulf of Riga, then, yeah, why wouldn't they be outside Warsaw? You know, it's like there's there's... there's if, if it was just like, oh, we stopped outside Warsaw, but we carried on fighting everywhere else, you'd go, yeah, okay, maybe there's a, a reason for that. But in actuality, there's evidence to say, no, actually, they, they were kind of at the end of their steam anyway. We can see that during uh, their strike towards uh, into Latvia. And Glantz, David Glantz, in uh, When Titans Clashed with House, also come to a similar conclusion. They argue, oh, actually... 
in order for them to have got to Warsaw, they would have had to redeploy units from elsewhere, and they were at the end of the logistics chain. And there were several of the reasons. The Germans um, reinforced the area, and you know, so on and so forth. There's a load of reasons as to why it's practically not possible for them to get into Warsaw in the August time. Maybe in the September, but uh, Glantz argues that that was probably a bit too late anyway. So, and, I, you know, I want to make this very clear. I'm not apologizing for what Stalin did. Um, I'm just saying that this is the situation. If you look at Operation Bagaration, the the drive seems to be mainly in the Minsk area, then to the north, and in the southern area. The middle area is where the Pripyat Marshes is, and that's not... It doesn't seem to be much of a priority in terms of what well, the that seems to be the aftermath. It seems to be the sort of well, we'll we'll move in that area as well. It's not really the the priority areas, and that's kind of what Glantz is saying when he says they'd have to redirect their entire effort. It would have been a major move, etc. But the even so, the Red Army got within twenty kilometers of Warsaw. In fact, they are actually fighting in the suburbs at one point, I believe, in late August. Um, so it's like well, surely they could have gone twenty kilometers. Well, they actually got forced back uh, from Warsaw a little bit by 20 kilometers as well. Uh, Modal issued an order to counterattack, and and they actually, the Germans managed to push them back. So it's it's not as clear cut as well. Stalin deliberately said stop. Um, it, it seems that they did actually genuinely come to a halt. Now, could they have reinforced this? Glenn says, "Well, yes, they could have had they moved forces." From elsewhere. So let me let me break this down because I think there's a few different points here and it's gonna get complicated and I don't know I don't want to spend all day on it. But basically, there's let's say three major points that can be made. There's the political argument, there's the military argument, and then there's the economic argument. Okay. And a lot of people have heard about the political argument and maybe some of the military one, and I don't think anyone's talked about the economic argument. I'll talk about that. So let me just give you a general overview. And I'm not apologizing for Stalin. I'm not a Stalin apologist, nor am I a pro-Soviet and whatever. I've said all that. I'm not going to go into it again. I'm just going to give you a sort of, from Stalin's perspective, does it really make sense to help the Polish government in exile or the home army? And the answer is obviously no, as you're about to see. So from the Soviet perspective, Stalin doesn't want a home army and a... British, you know, government in exile, Polish army, the Polish government. He doesn't want that. He wants his own Polish army that he can control from Moscow, and he wants his own uh, Polish government which he can control from Moscow. And this makes sense. He's just been invaded by the the Germans. He doesn't want the capitalist, evil capitalist West from striking him as well. So it makes sense to have a buffer state, uh, namely Poland, and so. From his perspective, he does not at any point say, you know, after the middle of 1943, he's, he's not even in contact with the Polish government in Britain. And he does not, he's shown it very clearly that he is not helping the home army in Poland. Uh, and he's set up his own army and his own government and he's supplying the uh, PPR, is it the PPR, the, the, in, the, in the east of Poland. And so on. So, from his perspective, he's given no sort of sign that, yes, I'm going to help the Poles in Warsaw. And so, politically, it doesn't really make... Why would he do that? I know, I'm going to help the Warsaw uprising. Why would he do that? It doesn't make any... From his perspective, it makes no sense to do it. And so, people have said, it makes no sense to do it. Therefore, Stalin, yeah, it's all Stalin's fault. Blah, blah, blah. Eh, no, because it's... You can't argue that. And I'm going to say why you can't argue. The reason you can't argue that is because it's it's Stalin, <laughs> right? Stalin's not going to help the Polish. I'm saying Stalin's not going to help the Polish Warsaw Uprising. Now, I'm not apologizing for, apologizing to Stalin. I'm saying he's not going to do it. He's not going to help the Polish Uprising, and it's pretty obvious. We've not even got to the Polish Uprising. It's pretty obvious he's not going to help them even before the Polish Uprising. So this argument, yeah, but see, it's Stalin's fault. He should have advanced twenty kilometers. He's not going to help them. That's not, that's an argument, you know, why would he help them? He, w he wouldn't. 
So why have the uprising and then go see it's Stalin's fault that like, he didn't help us? He should have done. It's like no, he didn't want to help. So that's not an argument to say yeah he should have helped. Like yeah, if he had been a normal, I'll say normal human being, he was no. If he hadn't have been an evil, you know, totalitarian dictator, then yes, he would have helped out the Polish army in in Warsaw. Yeah. But he's not. He's Stalin. And so using that as an excuse, oh, the Soviets didn't help us out, that's why it failed. It's like, no, he's not going to. You know, we uprose and the and the Soviets said they were going to help us and they didn't. It's like, no, it's Stalin. And they didn't say that. Well, they, they didn't say it. And maybe they did say it and, and stabbed them in the back. Yeah, but it's pretty obvious that what was going, or I think it is anyway, maybe for benefit of hindsight again. But I think it's pretty obvious that Stalin's not really helping out. The government in exile in Britain his, has no contact or little contact with, with the Soviet Union. And therefore, they're not. it's not an agreement. Yeah, okay, if you uprise, we'll help you out. Like, none of this happened. There was no coordination. And so this idea that, yes, the Soviets will help us out, no, they won't. And, and just hoping that they will, no, right? These commanders of the Polish government in exile and the home army were determined to seize Warsaw before the Red Army could, enabling them to greet the Soviets as Warsaw's rightful owners, who even had their own civil administration. So this was a last-minute ditch attempt to try and free Poland from anyone else's control. And uh, so it's understandable why they did it, but at the same time, it was not well executed uh, overall. Bohr was left with very few cards. If he chose to go ahead with the uprising, his only hope was that the Poles could prove their bravery and demonstrate national support for the Home Army and the legitimate Polish government in exile. But the Russians had not shown any goodwill, and they were not going to. Bohr also hoped that the very fact of the uprising would cause Roosevelt and Churchill to change their minds and come to the Poles' aid. But the Western Allies had already given in to Stalin and would do very little to help. So it's understandable why they went ahead and did it, because they had to to prevent the Soviets from taking over, but at the same time, they were alone. And so, yeah, you, they, they could blame the Allies and they could blame the Soviets for not giving them aid, but they knew prior to the even beginning the revolt, that yes, they weren't going to get any aid due to various reasons. The Soviets didn't want to give them aid, and the Western allies had already given in to Stalin because they needed Stalin's you know, Red Army in order to get to Berlin. So yeah, the, the Poles were left in the lurch, but they knew this before the Warsaw Uprising happened, and they still went ahead and did it. So that's the political sort of side. Now, again, not apologizing for Stalin. Did he do it deliberately? Probably. Uh, and it's interesting because, <laughs> in fact, let me find the quote. The Warsaw Uprising was initially sanctioned on the assumption of Soviet military assistance. So the assumption of Soviet military assistance. The point-blank refusal of this until September condemned the whole operation to a, uh, the most bloody failure. The reason for Stalin's decisions cannot be constructed from the Soviet archives because the key documents are missing. For instance, in one series of documents entitled Before the Eyes of the Kremlin, there is a gaping hole between the 29th of July and the 21st of August 1941, and in what one would imagine to be the key collection, Stalin and the Warsaw Uprising, there are no Soviet sources from the 8th of August to the 16th of September. And so, to quote Professor that guy, we find ourselves in that state of knowledge where the more or less logical reasoning of the historian must replace information from sources. And so I've had people in the past go, oh, the Soviet archives are open. <laughs> yeah, well, it, they've removed the documents we need. <laughs> so it's like they can be open all they want. There's the, the hiding stuff, right? Or they've burnt it. Um I think that's interesting. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, so, and as Professor That Guy's name, who I can't possibly pronounce, I can't bother finding out how to pronounce it, um, we're, we're left on speculation and sort of logic. Um, so I'm going to give you some of my logic now. So I don't think... I, I think it's right in the sense that, yes, Stalin was not going to help the Poles out, but that's, 
you know, it's pretty obvious that was going to happen anyway. So I think it's a poor argument to say, well, the, the Soviets didn't help us out. It's like, no. Um, yeah, I think that. Now, I've said that's the that's the mil- that's the political side of it. There's the military side of it as well. So Glantz has said, no, we don't think these guys could have actually got to the city. I actually think, yeah, I think they, they didn't do that. But I'm going to approach it from a slightly different angle. If you're going to have, let's say, a, an uprising or a parachute operation, right? Let's look at Market Garden, which is roughly the same time as this. In Operation Market Garden, right, the, the, the troops landed behind the lines and the tanks moved in for, and had two or three days to, to get through to the, the British and Arnhem, right? And ended up being like two weeks or whatever. So, okay. So that shows that, yes, as soon as you have guys behind the lines, they've only got a couple of days, right, before they need to be relieved. Now, obviously, the Polish uprising is a little bit bigger than that. And so you could say, well, they could last a little bit longer. Fine. But here's the deal. You need to have coordination with the troops that are coming to relieve you. You know, if, if they had coordination with the Soviets and said, right, we're going to do the uprising, it's probably best for, if the Soviets go, right, do it on this date and we will rescue you, you know, or it would be better if you, you know, we're going to launch this operation at this time. So if you want to uprise, now is, you know, this is the time you should do it. We'll plan it, we'll coordinate it together. And so we all link together and we, you know, that didn't happen. That did not happen militarily, and this is related to the political thing, there was no communication between the Polish-British government in exile and the Soviets. Uh, There was no coordination between the Home Army and the Soviet Red Army. There was no coordination at all. The reason why the Polish Warsaw Uprising began was because it was entirely the Home Army and the Polish government in Britain that went, right, we're going to do it. And they did it. They made. They seemed to have made the decision within a, a, like a two-week period. They just went, right, we're going to do it now. As Operation Bagration is happening, as the Soviets are moving towards Moscow, uh, Warsaw. But there was no coordination. There was no communication. Were, were the Soviets ever going to take Warsaw? Like, you know, we know the political argument. No, they didn't do it because of the Polish uprising or potentially didn't do it because of the Polish uprising. But would they have actually done it anyway? We know the Germans counterattacked and forced the the Red Army back a little bit. So it's like, no, I mean, the the we as far as we work, we know the, the, the Soviet army could have stopped at the Vistula. We don't know this. And so and they certainly didn't know this. There was no communication. And so this this army uprose in Warsaw but it was it wasn't it wasn't coordinated, and so then to turn around and go well actually it's the Russians' fault you know which is what a lot of them do it's like no you didn't coordinate it if the Soviets had said we are definitely going to take uh, Mos- uh, Warsaw it'll be roughly this time we've got several armies on the go now is the time for you to uprise that that's different it doesn't appear that that happened it appears that the Poles. In the home army and the government in exile decided to right. The Soviets are getting near. Now is the time to uprose. They they rose up. Oh, there's, there's no help. Uh, oh, it's the it's the Soviets' fault. It's like no, that, no, that that doesn't make it. That's not a good argument. And I'll give you another one as well. Um, this is another military one. The Polish government in exile didn't even coordinate with the British. Right? You think we're going to have this? Uprising in Warsaw, so what we should do is not only coordinate with the Soviets, but coordinate with the British and the the Americans and whoever else in the West, because we need all the support we can get. That didn't happen. They didn't do it. They uprose first and then went, right, give us support, people, and then no support came or little support came. Oh, well, it's everybody else's fault. No, don't uprise until you've you actually coordinate this properly with your allies or your enemies uh, in the case of the Soviets. You know, if the... Because what happened was um, on the... Let's say the 20th-ish 
uh, of July 1944, it seems to be making, you know, the Polish government in exile, the Polish Home Army are getting excited. Yes, the Soviets are getting near, but it's time for an uprising. Yeah. And then throughout the, the uh, you know, the late July period, they're like, yeah, we're planning this. We're going to have it happen. Da, 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 da. Um, and they're sort of trying to get help, but they're not really, there's no real time. It was all rushed at the last minute. The British are asked to help out, uh, and obviously the Americans as well, but the British are like, well, hold on a sec, how are we going to help you? Their armies are nowhere near. They can supply Poland, and they, they actually kind of do. Um, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, they kind of do, but they actually say, hey, you know, if we legitimize this government and this uprising, the Soviets aren't going to be very happy, and politically... It's going to be really tough for us because we want to make sure the Soviets reach Berlin or get to the nearby area of Berlin because otherwise we're going to have to do a lot more fighting on the Western Front. And so, you know, there's, there's things going on there. And the British actually say, hey, we can't, we'll, we'll accept, the, you know, we'll legitimize it and we'll try and supply you a little bit. But there was no real coordination about, yeah, we will definitely, will supply you and so on and so forth. There was no, and, and another request was made for the Polish parachute brigade that Sosabowski to drop into Warsaw and Sosabowski was actually looking forward to that but again there was no coordination with the British saying yeah yeah we'll definitely get the transports and no there was none of that it was just spontaneous this was like a we're gonna do it yay and then so they they actually went ahead and did it and then sought you know they, they struck the match first lit up this thing it was like right give us fuel now it's like no surely you should get the fuel before you strike the match right and so to then turn around and blame the Soviets or the British, well, I mean, you can blame the British to some extent, but you can't blame the British for like, well, you know, they didn't, they didn't coordinate it. A lot of the blame is actually on the Polish government in exile uh, and the Polish home army. Um, and now I'm not saying that the Poles are to blame. No, I think they should have uprose. I think it was a good they should have up Rose. I don't think this is a good time. I think they could have done a lot better. This was just a purely, poorly planned uprising, in my opinion, uh, in terms of the timing and in terms of the... They could have waited a couple of you know, more weeks and definitely got British and American support, definitely secured the Polish Parachute Brigade, definitely got confirmation from Moscow that yeah, okay, we're going to give you supplies and whatever else before they went ahead and did it. It seemed that they rushed it. It seemed that they did it almost spontaneously. And so, yes, it's a very interesting chapter of history, and I'm not criticising what the Poles in Warsaw did and, and the local revolts around it, so on and so forth. What I am criticising, though, is the Polish government in exile and the leadership of the Home Army they kind of messed up with this. They could have done it better. But then to turn around and go, the British didn't help us out. It's like, yeah, but you didn't help yourselves. You could, you know, you could have waited another week, secure British, definitely secure. But yeah, we'll, we'll supply you. We'll, we'll do this. You know, because part of this, they couldn't, the British tried to supply the Polish well, Warsaw Uprising, but they couldn't do it properly because the weather was bad and the moon was bad. They were miles away. Um, so they did supply them partly, although nowhere near enough, but they had to send the bombers and the transport aircraft over without fighter support because they were that far away from the, the bases that they, they just, they, and so there was heavy losses, you know, some of the accounts, there's tons of losses of aircraft as a result of this. And so it's like, okay, maybe they should have secured Soviet air assistance or, you know, maybe got a, a base in the Soviet Union, although that's another issue, it wasn't going to happen, but, you know, there, there could have been things done, you know, that, all right, we might have delayed it by a week or two, which, you know, and then gone ahead with it, and then, yeah, that might have helped, all right? But they didn't even secure the Polish parachute uh, brigade. They didn't, they didn't do it. It's like they'd screwed up massively, um, in my opinion. I think that, I'll be interested to see what you think, but, uh, yeah. And the Soviets did also supply them. The Americans did from uh, southern Italy, I believe. 
But again, heavy losses. And the Soviets were like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give them a bit, few supplies, gave them a few supplies. And it's like, yeah, right. Because the, again, Stalin's not one to help these guys out. So again, it's just, I think A, it's kind of bad timing. B, it was on the, you know, the hope and the sort of, we suspect that the Soviets will come into Warsaw rather than they definitely are and we've planned it out and it's all timed well and we've got their support. We've got the British and the American support. No, it, they, they screwed up massively. But there's even more to this than that. So if we look again at the map, what we can see is that the purple area, again, is Bagration. And if you think about it from this perspective up to the purple line, let's say, then what would you do? Would you carry on going to Warsaw? Or would you strike north, which they did in the green bit, to take or trap Army Group North in Estonia or Kurland? Uh, would you go south into, let's say, the blue area, which is what the Soviets actually did, uh, and strike into Romania and take the oil fields in Romania and then move into Hungary and take... I mean, it wasn't quite as big, but there's some oil fields in Hungary as well. Uh, or would you go directly west and take... Warsaw, um, huh, right? If you look at it from this point of view, it's like, no, no, the priority is clearly trapping Army Group North and or striking into Romania and destroying the so the Axis oil fields, uh, which would prevent the Germans from effectively waging the war. And it does. It grounds the Luftwaffe uh, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I... I honestly, looking at the map strategically, it's like militarily, it makes more sense to go where the greens and the blues are than it does to go uh, straight to the west. And in actuality, what we find out is that the Soviets don't take Warsaw, right? Bear in mind, the Warsaw Uprising is in August of 1944. The Soviets don't take Warsaw until 1945, right? Mid-January. I think it's January the 17th. Uh, they take Warsaw during their Vistula Oda offensive. And so, yeah, I mean, it's several months later. And so the Soviets are really prioritizing their flanks. And this makes sense given the context. It's like, yes, they need to go south and get the oil fields, take them out. They need to go north and trap Army Group North, right? So those are the priorities. And they can't strike everywhere at the same time. And so they deprioritize the center for those flanks. And if we think back to 1920, when the Soviets came towards Warsaw and were hit on the flanks by the war, the uh, uh, Polish army at the time on the uh, uh, what's his name Pilsudski, then it kind of makes sense. So actually, yeah, we're we're going, you know, we got to secure the flanks because we don't want the same thing happen again, but this time with the German army. So looking at it, Mirator. Militarily, from a strategic point of view, right, and, and, and further away from the Moscow axis, yeah, it actually makes a lot of sense why the Soviets wouldn't prioritize taking Warsaw and getting bogged down in a city fight when there's oil fields, when there's Army Group North to surround, when there's flanks to secure. It kind of makes sense. And the fact that it took them several months, uh, well, you know, the, the uprising happened in August and they didn't take Warsaw till January, that kind of suggests, yeah, their priority wasn't Warsaw, it was elsewhere. Uh, now, again, could they have, you know, oh, well, the priority is elsewhere, but we, we can prioritise just enough to get that extra 20 miles or whatever to Warsaw. But again, you'd have to get bogged down in military fighting inside the city of Warsaw. The priority is elsewhere. It doesn't make sense for politically. We've already been over that. So Stalin's like, what's the point? And and so that the military kind of backs up. It makes you know makes perfect sense not to do that. Um, and this is what the, some of the historians like Glantz are saying. Like actually, the priority seems to be elsewhere, the south and the north. So that's the military context really. But it's also the economic context. If you strike into Romania, if you if you take out the oil fields in Romania and Hungary, and if you damage the economy of the Third Reich of North, then the war will be over quicker. 
And so it makes sense to go to Romania. It makes sense to try and trap Army Group North. It makes sense to go into Hungary. And also strategically looking at the big picture, it also makes sense to go and take uh, former Yugoslavia, that area, or uh, the Balkans and secure Soviet uh, hegemony, hegemony in the Balkans because that's what they wanted to do prior to the second well prior to them getting involved in the second world war during the um the alliance uh the nazi soviet pact the molotov ribbentrop pact you know part of the thing was the soviets wanted the balkans uh, as part of their sphere of influence and hitler wasn't happy with that well post-war of course stalin wants to secure the balkans as well as eastern europe in general and so, again, it's like, well, yeah, priorities elsewhere. It's not, let's free Warsaw. And you've got to remember as well, it's like, well, look how close they were to, you know, half of the other cities. Why did, If Krakow or Krakow had gone up in, uh, you know, arms, it's like, well, they should have gone and got helped Krakow out. Like, no, they didn't go towards Krakow. They didn't go towards Warsaw. Their priority was elsewhere. And that makes sense, again, given the fact that it takes them till January to take it and yeah the, the taking out the oil of Romania was devastating for the Germans the, the Luftwaffe were grounded the uh, Kriegsmarine was you know devastated and that's not including the tanks that the Germans have you know they run out of fuel um, and you know if you look at the map again it's like the, the blue area was taken by August or the end of August September and obviously that has a major impact when you get to the Battle of the Bulge and they're trying to desperately find oil uh, supplies as they strike into the Allied lines or the American lines. And so, yeah, th this makes sense. Take out Romania, take out the oil, uh, economically devastate the, the German supply lines and logistics. And yeah, so really... Like, from a strategic point of view, it makes sense not to go to Warsaw right this second in time. If, arguably, uh, the, you know, let's say Stalin had given the go-ahead in early January. Hey, by the way, we're going to strike Warsaw in early January. The Warsaw uprising happened, and then Stalin went, ha, 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 and then, you know, ignored the city. Then you've probably got an argument, but I think, I think it was bad timing. I think that the Soviets, whether they did it deliberately or not, I think the Soviets really have, you know, the Red Army has real legitimate claims to go, well, actually, it makes more sense to go into Romania uh, and the North, etc. And, we, you know, they are quite, it's clearly that they are stretched thin as it is. And so they can't just, you know, there's this, the myth of we have ultimate numbers, you know, stupid amount of hordes of, Red Army soldiers. No, they, at this point, they were forcefully recruiting Latvians, they were forcefully recruiting uh, Estonians, Lithuanians, Poles. They were forcefully recruiting everybody they can get their hands on because they were running out of man manpower. Because while, yes, they might have more man men than the Germans do, but ultimately, there's only a finite number of people in the world, and the, the Soviets didn't have as you know infinite amount of troops and they were running out in this period i've mentioned this in in the curling documentary uh and so their forces were stretched thin they had to prioritize and it makes sense militarily economically and even politically unfortunately to not go to Mos uh, to warsaw in 1944 and so, yeah, that is a pretty significant counter-argument. But then you have the other side of it, which is, well, actually, wait a second. The Poles are clearly caught between two ideological empires. They want independence. They want uh, to, you know, have a rising. And it makes sense to do it when, well, before the Soviets arrive. It makes sense to do it before the Soviets arrive, so they are, hey, look, we're an independent. But let's not forget as well, the Estonians did the same. Uh, it's actually, it was probably after this period, actually. But the Estonians did the same. Um, in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, the uh, free forces of the Estonian military 
actually rebel. I cover this in, slightly in the Curling series. They actually, you know, try to fight. They actually f- they fought against the, the Germans as they were leaving, and then fought against the Soviets as they were arriving. Uh, but they were crushed as well. So, you know, again, it, I mean, the, the Soviet, the Red Army is clearly not interested in having independent states on its borders. It wants uh, puppet states and annexations. Um, and that's bad. It is bad, but it's not like, you know, the Polish government in exile can't say, well, the, you know, they didn't help us out. It's like, well, yeah, they didn't because that's what they do. They, it was kind of, you know, whether this is hindsight speaking again, I don't know. But I, I just think it's like, yeah, no, they, they shouldn't have expected the Soviets to help them to that extent because it's kind of clear, you know, that the Soviet Union carved up their country, right? Because, you know, the, that's... The Germans and the, the, the Soviets carved up Poland in 1939. So clearly expecting the Polish government in exile to you know, for the Soviets to support them. It's like, no, what are you doing? That you're out, You've been at war with these guys. Why would you expect them to help you? Again, I, I think there's misconceptions and I and it it really does... It really does come across as though the, the Polish were desperate, which they are. They wanted the uprising to happen so that they could create their own independent uh, government and country, which is fine. It's understandable. But they rushed it. And they could have, at the least, secured British and American approval. Because the British and Americans were kind of reluctant. Hey, this is not a good idea, for various reasons. They went ahead and did it anyway, and then complained, well, you didn't support us. And it's like, well, yeah, it's understandable. I I, I agree. The, the British and Americans and the, the Soviets should have supported this effort. And as I say, if Stalin hadn't been... An evil totalitarian dictator, yes, they, he would have probably done. And if the British and Americans, you know, if the Polish government in exile had secured proper support and not rushed into this, you know, if they'd have waited a few weeks and got the support first, and the, you know, and the Polish parachute brigade and whatever else, then yes, this could have uh, gone a bit better at the very least. But they didn't do any of that. And so it's not just one side or not, there's blame on all sides. Stalin's an evil dictator, the British and Americans could have done more. Um, but I also think the Polish government in exile, especially, kind of dropped the ball on this one. Um, but I understand where they're coming from. I understand why they did it. I understand the timing of it. Um, they thought, they assumed that the Red Army was going to get into Warsaw at the same time, which they didn't do. But they assumed that was going to happen. So it makes sense to do it when they did. And, and But unfortunately, it was bad timing. And my point is that they should have just coordinated it. And they didn't. Um, so that's my take on the... Warsaw Uprising at the minute but I'm kind of playing devil's advocate again I do feel like the Poles got the worst I you know because after the war in 1946 they had the the uh, plebiscite the also or the referendum and they had the elections of 1947 uh, which were just it was rubbish right <laughs> they, they basically so yeah yeah we got legitimate we won uh, and it's like no you didn't uh, and a puppet state was formed, and there's a whole thing going on with that. I think, as I say, Poland got a raw deal in World War Two. Uh, the British, arguably, and probably, for an, you know, I understand again why the British didn't push for more, but they arguably betrayed Poland. I also see the Soviets definitely betray Poland. Uh, <clears throat> the Americans didn't help out. There's a lot of things going on here, but ultimately, Poland gets caught between two, just like the Baltic states, they get caught between two ideological imperialist empires and are crushed, and yeah, they get the raw deal. Um, but you can't, at the same time, I don't think it's right to then go, you know, we the the Allies should have done more, or the Soviets should have done more. It, like, that's just... You're expecting too much given the circumstances and given the fact that the whole thing was rushed. It was, you know, it doesn't make sense to go. I understand it, but it doesn't make sense to say that, in my opinion. But I'd be interested to see what people think about this. So I will leave it there. Hope that's answered your questions. Let me know what you guys think. Bye for now.